Hi, I'm Khalilo Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. But before we get started, head over to takingstock-ja.com to subscribe to our newsletter. You can click the link in the description box below. Later on in the program, I'll be announcing the winners of last week's giveaways. And I also have another giveaway this week. So come on, let's get this money. First up, Edufocal and QuickPlate are both ditching the office for good. After months of working from home, Edufocal CEO Gordon Swaby and QuickPlate CEO Monique Powell have both decided they don't need a physical office after all. We'll discuss. And later, the analysts swain on the latest market developments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange is now ranked among the 10 worst performing markets in the world, a complete 180 from last year's chart-topping performance. And NCB Financial Group hit a 52-week low last week. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. The Jamaica Stock Exchange, JC, has fallen among the worst 10 performing stock markets globally, reversing its remarkable achievements just a year ago. That's according to an analysis done by the Gleaners' Stephen Jackson. The JC is down some 27% so far this year. Based on data from Country Economy, an open-source data center cross-referenced with Bloomberg and JC Data, the JC was positioned at the sixth worst stock market midweek. The Nasdaq in the United States topped the world as the best performing market, with the worst performing market being in Costa Rica. The JC Combined Index had its worst day on March 25, when the market closed at just over 337,500 points, down 33% from its high of over 508,000 on January 2. And stay tuned, Stephen will join us on the analyst segment of this program to discuss. The cost of goods and services remained about the same in May as they were in April. According to the Statistical Institute of Jamaica Statin, inflation for May 2020 was just 0.1%. Prices for food and non-alcoholic beverages, which carry the most weight in the inflation basket, rose by 1.1%. Higher light bills also caused a 1.5% rise in the category housing, water and electricity, gas and other fuels. How much did your light bill go up by? Click above to take our poll. Another utility company has come out saying that losses from theft are passed on to paying customers. This time, it's the National Water Commission, NWC. NWC's corporate communications manager, Andrew Cannon, says the rates set by the Office of Utilities Regulation allows them to recover the cost of production, which includes stolen water. However, newly installed Water Minister Daryl Vaz tweeted that the move is unjust and an unsustainable way of operating. He says he will be meeting with the relevant parties for a full explanation and discussion. NWC's admission follows that from the Jamaica Public Service JPS recently that the OUR has also allowed them to bill paying customers to recover losses from electricity theft. The National Commercial Bank NCB says it's cutting 121 jobs starting July 10. The redundancy follows the previously announced closure of three branches and the rollout of a new branch model. The bank says it's been able to redeploy some team members to new roles, but it hasn't indicated how many. In a statement Friday, NCB says under the new model, cash transactions will be facilitated exclusively via the 24-7 Bank on the Go areas in up to 14 branches. Barita shareholders have approved resolutions to allow the company to raise fresh capital through an additional public offering APO. Barita is seeking more funds to exploit new business opportunities. The shareholders voted at the company's AGM on July 6 for Barita to issue up to 200 million new ordinary shares. They also have the option to upsize the issue by another 100 million ordinary shares if the offer is oversubscribed. No price has yet been set for the APO. Meanwhile, General Manager Paula Barclay announced at last week's AGM that the company will be opening two new locations, one on Nutswood Boulevard in New Kingston and another in Montego Bay. Community and Workers of Jamaica Cooperative Credit Union is expected to list $900 million of deferred shares on the JC by the end of the month. A deferred share is a share of stock on which a dividend is not paid until some fixed date. The listing will be a first in Jamaica's credit union history and will allow credit union members to trade their shares with non-members. 
The shares were to be listed last year, but the process was delayed due to a number of concerns raised, including who could own the shares and how the credit union would account for the shares on its books once they're listed. CEO of CNWJ, CCUL, Carlton Barclay, says all the issues have now been resolved. And over $2 billion in funding will be made available for small and medium tourism enterprises, SMTEs, to help them retool and rebound from the COVID-19 pandemic. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett says SMTEs have been severely displaced due to COVID-19 and have recorded economic fallout of an average of $2.5 million each. He says the assistance will be from multilateral partners and financial institutions such as the Development Bank of Jamaica, World Bank, Jamaica Social Investment Fund, Exim Bank and Jamaica National Group. SMTEs will have access to a suite of loans and grants ranging from as low as $5 million up to a maximum of $30 million. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. And when we come back, is going office less a new trend in business? We'll discuss. Hey guys, so as one of Kalila's followers, I am answering her call to share how taking stock has impacted our financial journey on our investment journey. So my name is Galeon. I started investing a year and change ago. I bought Wigton IPO when it came out. I had no knowledge of what a stock was, none whatsoever. I did not know that Jamaica had its own stock exchange. I really, really didn't know anything about investment. So, but I bought the stock anyway. Everybody was buying it, heard it was a good buy. You know, the average Jamaican can finally buy into the stock market. Sure, great, I'm going to start this thing. But um, as somebody who's a researcher in real life, I started researching and learning more about investments. And part of that was um, through, stake, through taking stock. I first learned about it from listening to the front page on Nationwide News, which I only had started listening to a few months after I bought Wigton. And through that, I listened to, I started following Kalila on Instagram and I started listening to all of her shows, Taking Stock, What's In It For Me, What's On My Mind, Money Moves JA, Money Mondays, all of that. And so what Taking Stock did was not only did it bring well-researched information in layman's terms to the persons watching, it also connected us to the people that she brought on the show. Because if you watch the show, you'll know that in the description, she puts the social media information for the analysts in, in particular that she brings on the show. And that's how I got connected to other people and started learning even more about investments. So thank you, Kalila. Now I have, um, you know, with the advice of my financial advisor, of course, and other friends and people that I know in investments, I have had seminars at church and work for investments where Devroyd has spoken, my financial advisor has spoken. And for myself, I not only am I well on my way, I don't have millions yet, like I said, but I am moving towards being debt free while saving and investing, creating an emergency fund. And I even blog about investment. So that's the more I know, like you started with your own journey, the more people can know and we just continue to educate people. So thanks for your show and for the work that you put into it to bring us this knowledge that I can share with all of my friends as well and anybody who wants to hear because even in the articles, I point them back to the source that I got my stuff from, which is you and um, several other people. So thanks, Kalila, for this opportunity. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by... Bulwark Insurance Agent. Insurance made easy. Welcome back to Taking Stock and big up to Galeon Williams who just gave her testimonial about how Taking Stock has impacted her investing journey. You could be next week's feature. Just post a video of yourself on Instagram stating how Taking Stock or Money Mondays JA have impacted your life. Tag me at Kalila Ray and at Taking Stock JA for a chance to be featured and to win a $10,000 gift certificate towards purchasing stocks of your choice at a firm of your choice. The winner will be announced in next week's episode. Now to our guests for this segment. 
e-learning company EduFocal CEO Gordon Swaby announced via Twitter that he will be closing the company's physical office for good and will instead operate remotely. Similarly, CEO of the food delivery service Quick Plate Monique Powell is also ditching her office. What led to this decision and what are the implications? They join us now. Hi Gordon, hi Monique, thanks for joining me. Hi Kalilo. Hey. Hey. Thanks for having me. Your two companies are, it's interesting that you've both made the decision right around the same time because you are two of the, the young entrepreneurs, the new wave that's coming through with the innovative type of businesses, the online model. So Monique, Quick Plate is kind of like, well, for those abroad who want to know what it's like, you could compare it, I guess, to an Uber Eats. You pick up a food delivery service and you order online. And then Edufocal, Gordon, you've been on before. So you teach content for mostly primary school students yeah. via an online yeah. format as well. And so now yeah. you've both decided to just embrace the digital space, which you already had, but fully embrace it and go office-less completely. So mm -hmm. Monique, being the, the, since this is your first time on the show, let's start with you. Uh, why did you make this decision? It was an easy one for us. It, it, we always had a couple of remote and semi-remote team members. So there's, there's even one member of our team that lives in an entirely different country. And then there were a couple of persons, including myself, who would only pop into the office one or, once or twice per week. So when we were forced to have everybody working from home in the initial stages of us dealing with this COVID-19 crisis, we realized that everything kept running smoothly. There weren't any noticeable differences in terms of efficiency and productivity. So we thought, why not just have this become a permanent thing for everybody, you know? Um, additional flexibility for our team members, cutting out the commute to and three hours worth of time spent in commute, all of that. Mm -hmm. So it was an easy decision. It, was, it, it wasn't, as I say, it wasn't brand new to us, but embracing it fully for all members of the team was new but it, it was a no-brainer in a sense for us. So Gordon, what about you? What has the experience been like that has led you to this decision to just ditch the office? So, you know, similar to, to, to Monique's sentiments, um, my CTO, you know, does not live in Jamaica. He's in New York. Um, and, you know, so he's worked remotely for a while, you know. Similarly for me... That would be I, Chief, I, I, Chief I, Technical I, Officer. Yeah, yeah. So my CTO and my co-founder, Paul Allen, he lives in New York. But, you know, similar to money, I, I didn't go in office often, maybe once, twice per week. I have a pretty decent home setup. Um, and if I'm not working from home, I'm on the road in meetings. Um, you know, so I, I was never in office. And <clears throat> with a team of <clears throat> around 15 people, maybe three or four people would be in office on a weekly basis. So, you know, when you look at the pros and cons and, you know, if you're really seeing a return on your investment, uh, you know, not necessarily there. Um, so we decided to make a conscious decision. Obviously, COVID had, you know, had some, some part in it in terms of us being forced to work from home. Um, because one of the conversations I had with my team very early out was, guys, you know, once the first case is announced in Jamaica, immediately, we're all going to be working from home. And prior to that, we were looking at a, a work from home policy, not totally getting rid of the office, but you know, having the flexibility some days to work from home, other days working from the office. But we decided to just take the leap and you know, have them fully work from home. And, and in fact, let me, let, me, let me be clear, it's not even work from home, but work remotely. So my team members don't have to live in Kingston anymore. If they want to live elsewhere in Jamaica where, you know, the only requirement is, is good quality internet. Once there's solid internet, um, really my team members can work from anywhere, whether in Jamaica or elsewhere. Um, obviously, there are challenges. Um, I was having a conversation with one team member this week, and you know, she was explaining to me that you know, she, she misses the, the camaraderie of right. physically being in a space um, with somebody. And I mean, she was one of our, our, our employees who was in the physical office space. Um, and of course, the trauma of COVID has not helped um, because it's, all, it's, all, it's almost as if we were forced into a particular situation. So there is some kind of adjusting to do, and I, I do want to have a, a team retreat 
in August where we all meet up as a, a team. And I mean, we've done hiring since, right? So we've had we've had one new yeah one new person since COVID, um, and we're going to be doing new hires. So that's also going to be um, new for me in terms of navigating how to get you know new new people acquainted with the current team members. But it's not insurmountable. These are problems that can be solved. In fact, let me not even refer to them as problems. It's just a new way of work and figuring out how to how to um how to to, 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 to get you know new employees acquainted with, with 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 current team members. And finally for us, um we'll be saving easily two to three million dollars a year by not having an office, right? Um poss- possibly even more. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there there's that. Where was their office? So our office was sixty seven Grand Spain Road, right behind Tile City. Um, before that, we were at um, UTEC. We were at UTE- on the UTEC campus for years at Technology. Um, we moved to the new address sometime last year, November last year. So we've been at this new address um, for about six months now. We're actually looking to, to get an, an even larger office. You know, it's yeah. really interesting because both of you are describing, you know, the transition to... To, to just making that leap to a completely virtual space. I'm going through the same thing with my business right now, and I'm leaning towards just keeping this current format. Of course, there are little tweaks. I thought that I needed this big space, studio space, desk, lighting, all yeah. all the fancy things, and would have to eventually invest in that space. And I'm realizing now that it may not be necessary we can do this thing online i have a team that works entirely remotely some of them i've never met in person and this is the new way i say twitter also recently announced that the work from home thing for their staff they'll have the option to continue that too so monique gordon raised the issue of camaraderie within the the office people feel like and that's going to be one of the challenges but you haven't completely abandoned the office because you actually need a physical space for something so what's your model we had two offices on a shared floor and we gave up one of them entirely and we have one that is still there but that's mainly for the purposes of storage really I mean, the desks and a couple of desks and chairs are still there, you know, if somebody's having internet trouble at home and needs to, to, to connect real quick, they can always pop in. Uh, but we haven't been there as a team for over four months. Uh, so everybody on the team is operating remotely still. Uh, in terms of, you know, managing the relationships between people and, and culture and so forth, that's something that we're going to have to figure out as we go along. You know, um, I've, for instance, put in place a, a stand-up meeting that happens three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We just all pop on, you know, for 15 minutes, no more than that, just to quickly, you know, tell each other what we're working on, what challenges we're encountering, help each other with, with quick fixes, that sort of thing, just to make sure that we're not all operating in silo, in a sense. And I'm sure we'll figure out as we go along how to kind of do team building activities and 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 facilitate discourse discourse in a way that still has members of the team feeling connected to each other uh so it's it's gonna be a work in progress you know we're, we're learning as we go along how to best manage this remote work setup in such a way that we don't lose we already know that we're not losing efficiency and productivity but we also don't necessarily want to lose the vibe between team members as well so you know that's something that we will learn as we go along Mm -hmm. so gordon had mentioned he gave a dollar figure as to how much he's saving do you mind saying monique how much savings this would result in for your business well, we're, we, we we're already keeping things lean in terms of how much we're spending. So it's, it's, the savings is probably just going to be a little under half a million dollars. A year or what? Per year. Okay. So you didn't, you didn't have that high rent no, that many no. places so, in the corporate so area come with? Cost, is, cost, of course, was one of the considerations because as a team grew, we would have to be thinking about moving out of that space into a bigger one, etc. But it really was at the bottom of the list for me in terms of um, factors influencing the decision. Oh, cost yeah. was at the bottom of the list. So what was at the top of the list? At the top of the list for me, it, I was looking at benefits to the team members. So 
for somebody who takes public transportation, for example, they could easily spend three hours a day just commuting, waiting at the bus stop, you know, um, being in transit, that sort of thing. That's three hours a day easily for somebody or more. Uh, so no, that's completely eliminated. And then there is also the matter of flexibility. You know, as, as Garin said earlier, this is remote work, not necessarily work from home. So even if you don't feel like being at home, you can work from a coffee shop, work from a co-working space. If one of my team members get up tomorrow and say, you know, I want to live in Mexico for a month, you know, my only question is, do you have solid internet connection? If you do that, that's fine. You know, um, so there's that that kind of flexibility. And of course, you know, you may have people who are taking care of, you know, small kids, elderly parents who are at home. And this kind of setup allows them to work while being close to those people. So the, the, the benefits for the team members for me, um, those are the first considerations influencing my decision to do this. But what about your drivers? Don't they have to yeah, for me, get a physical location? As I said, you know, the, the, the initial part of this facing this COVID-19 crisis kind of forced everybody to find a new way of working. And what we found is that we didn't necessarily need to have them check in physically on a daily basis. You know, we have our technology is such that once our drivers log on to their app to start the day, we can pick up exactly where their location is, you know, that they're ready to get going. Uh, so having them physically come in, we realized was actually completely unnecessary. Because they actually work as independent contractors and they own their own vehicles. So, so right, they don't they do. need to, it's not like you have a fleet of vehicles parked at the office anyway. Exactly, exactly. And like I said, you know, there is, we did keep one of the two offices we have. So if there is ever a need for somebody to, you know, actually pick up a delivery bag or pick up some shirts or whatever it may be, there is that touch base point that is still there. But it's probably going to, to hardly be used, you know. I'd, I wouldn't be surprised if nobody is in there more than once per month. Mm -hmm. Gordon, you had something that you wanted to add just now? No, I was just making the point too that for us it actually wasn't even a cost consideration. Um, it was, I'd say, at the top of at the top of my list was team productivity um, and ensuring that the team is happy. And and for a lot of the, I'd say, all of our team members, everybody was open to the idea um, about remote work and and work from home. So you know I, that was primarily why I made the decision. And one of the things I quickly realized too is that they're more productive from home anyway. Um, oh, you know, if you think about it, we we yeah we had team members that live downtown, for example, and you know for them to get to work um, coming from downtown to essentially constant spring run on a daily basis is it's a, you know it's it's lost productivity. Um, and if you can get up in the morning and you can just sit by your computer and start working, um, obviously any focal benefits, you know, it it it, it is hugely beneficial to the company. So that was one of the big reasons that we decided to make that move, not even necessarily a, a financial move. Um, because also one of the things that we're, we're going to be doing is we're going to be, you know, having certain benefits, you know, so we may have, I, I, I may not use a correct word or term, but this almost in some effect a stipend of sorts, you know, to help, for example, offset um, electricity costs associated with working from home. Um, we'll have additional benefits, you know, possibly gym membership for the, you know, for the team members, that kind of thing. Obviously, you want to keep your, 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 your team members happy. Um, uh, I mean, what we can do to, to, to help or aid in that process, and certainly um, it's something that we're going to consider. Yeah, because you can use those, siphon those same savings from not having to, to exactly. pay rent every month towards exactly. that. Yeah. But there are some team members who might, who working from home might not be ideal for them. And I think of myself, for example, I have very young kids. I cannot get work done at home because if I'm at home, yeah. they're going to be all over me. So, yeah. And we do have team members that have, what, How do you overcome kids. that um, challenge? So that's that's exactly my point earlier. I mean, so we'll, we're probably going to have... Um, membership at, at specific co-working hubs so if a team member wants to go and work from one of the co-working hub spaces they can um so we'll facilitate that kind of thing um and i mean i know there are other spaces in kingston and montego bay for example most well, most all our, our employees are between montego bay and kingston so the facilities are in kingston to accommodate it um and you know if that's the case if they want to get up every day and go to a specific space and work from we have no issues facilitating that I, I, again ultimately their happiness um, is in our best interest. We want, you know, we want them to be happy. Um, and if it means not working from home, then no issue with me. I have no problems with that. I have no problems facilitating that. 
you know, both of your businesses have exploded since COVID because you both have, <laughs> you've been fortunate, you've been blessed. You both have business models that put you in a position to capitalize on the new way of doing things. So people wanted to order in more quickly. It was already there. Monique, when COVID hit, what did you foresee happening at that time? And has that has it gone how you expected it to go? I, I think a number of persons who I've spoken to, I, I think a lot of people were under the impression that, you know, it would have been an immediate explosion, you know, in terms of business tripling um, as soon as the, the, the first case um, was announced here. But it wasn't quite like that. It, it, it took a couple of weeks well for people to make conscious decisions around changing their behavior. So it took, it took a few weeks for persons who had never done any kind of business online to say, all right, let me give this a try. It took a few weeks for people who used to order food delivery as a once in a while treat to start doing it several times per week. So what we found is that the real uptick has actually been in the last, I'd say, two and a half months thereabouts. And that is, I think that was pretty much in line with what I expected to happen. I knew it wouldn't um, bring about a change in behavior overnight, but I knew that persons would begin to gravitate to ordering food online, ordering grocery online. And what I expect to happen beyond this point is that things won't go back to how they were before. So now that you've discovered that there is a much more convenient way of getting your meals, of getting your grocery, it's very unlikely that even when some life returns to normal, for want of a better word, um, it's likely that a lot of the behaviors that persons picked up during this time are behaviors that they'll continue to, to demonstrate in their daily lives. And for you, Gordon, do you worry that post-COVID, if there is such a thing as post-COVID, because we said that we're living with it now, but do you worry that the behavior change that we've seen over the past few months is going to, is actually temporary and people will revert to how they used to do things online in terms of education? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, Kalila, we had big plans for 2020 um, pre-COVID. That ha has not changed um, since COVID came around. So obviously when we we're planning, we we're making our plans for 2020, we didn't factor in COVID, right? Um, and we had big plans for this year um, in terms of the, the company and where we we're going. Um, you know, ultimately what has happened is, you know, things have worked out in our favor even better now. Uh, we have a really great partner in Mayberry. We closed a, a private equity run with Mayberry recently. And I mean, if we were strong before, we're even stronger now. So Congratulations I'm, I'm on that, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm very happy about, you know, the partnership with, 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 with Mayberry. I work very closely with Chris Berry. Uh, he's excited about where we're going. Um, and we're really, really, we're really excited about our plans and, you know, what we have in store for the next few months, I think it's going to be very, very exciting. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting all of that stuff rolled out. I've heard you hinting that there is an IPO in the future for Edufocal. Yes? <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, we've always had IPO dreams and ambitions. I personally always had IPO dreams and ambitions for Edufocal. Um, so definitely it is, it is in the works for the future. Um, when what type I of timeline are you looking at? I can't see the timeline right now, for sure. Um, but it is going to happen. For sure it is but, going to happen. But um, more likely years than months, though. I, <laughs> I can't say. Uh, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Okay. Well, <laughs> Monique, the same, question, the same question has to go to you, Monique. I heard, you, I heard Randy ask you about that on, on earnings season recently as well. Uh, any plans for IPO for Quick Plate in the future? Uh, no immediate plans. I mean, it's it's not something I'm ruling out. Actually, it's something I think is, is very likely to happen at some point. Uh, like Gordon, I, there's there's no timeline on it. I'm, I'm genuinely unable to say when that would happen. But it is, it, it is highly likely that at some point in time, that's an avenue that we'll, we'll, we'll explore. How long have you been around quickly? Since the start since March 2016, so a little over four years. Four years, yeah, yeah, just about four years, four and four and change. And Gordon Edgefocal has been around since what year? 
double that 20, 2012 um we're nine next eight, year nine next yeah. year all yeah right. eight and a half years next year march is nine years yeah well all the best to you both in your new office less space you work from home <laughs> thank you uh, thank I look you forward to big moves and big announcements coming soon yeah man thank you for having us Kalilo. when we come back i've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by this segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange continued its decline last week, with the combined index losing nearly 3%. 99 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, July 10, 2020. 34 advanced, 56 declined and 9 stayed the same. Nearly 141 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling nearly $682 million. Mailpack Group traded the most taking up nearly 29% of market volume. However, the stock lost 36 cents to open the week at $2.01. cent. Trans Jamaican Highway traded the second highest, with people buying and selling 22 million shares in the company. The stock gained 3 cents to close the week at $1.40. Cents. And Wigton Wind Farm was also among the most traded, taking up nearly 13% of market volume. The stock lost 1 cent to close last week at 78 cents. Now, let's see who had the biggest gains. ISP Finance Services rose 33% to close last week at $15.98. Indus Pharma Jamaica Ordinary shares up 27% to close last week at $2.96. And rounding out the biggest gains, Portland JSX opens this week at $9.00. On the losing side now, JMMB Group 7.25% VR Jamaican Dollar CR preference shares fell 25% to close last week at $1.28. Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances fell 23% to end last week at $10.50 a share. And Nutsford Express Services lost nearly 18% down to $6.57. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by Senior Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Auric Angus. Senior Business Reporter at the Gleaner Company, Stephen Jackson. His views are his own on this program. And Young Investor at the University of the West Indies, David Rhodes. Welcome back, David, Stephen, Auric. Always good to have you guys on. Thank, Thank you, Carlina. Thanks. So, Stephen, you wrote an article for the yeah. Gleaner in, what was it, last week, Wednesday. So the, the Gleaner on business pages on Wednesday, talking about how the Jamaica Stock Exchange has actually made a complete U-turn from last year and is now one of the worst performing stock exchanges in the world so far this year where'd you get that information what was what's that about it's a couple of sources the first source is um from a non-aligned site called country economy and i cross cross-referenced it with um bloomberg data because the bloomberg data had it over one year spans as opposed to over uh the first year to the six six months uh, at least I couldn't get that six month data. And so what you found is just that, that um, Costa Rica was the worst performing and Jamaica, the Jamaica Stock Exchange was the sixth worst amongst, it was 90, about 90 exchanges that I, I did a cross-reference analysis of, I, um, which, which, of course, a year earlier, we would have been in the top 10. Mm -hmm. uh, now, essentially, NASDAQ and Venezuela are leading the world uh, in terms of the index performance. David and Auric, I know you guys you know, would have seen this news as well. Does this come as a surprise to any of you? You first, David. No, this doesn't necessarily come as a surprise. So 
about six stocks make up the majority of the JSC's overall market capitalization. So it was at as a high of around two trillion dollars probably late last year. And when the year started, stocks like NCB Financial Group, Sajiko Group Jamaica, uh, Scotia Group Jamaica were trading at significant highs and they've all taken significant uh, declines in recent times. So when it comes on, to, and the thing is that they had to factor in reality that Trans Jamaica had already pushed the market further down with the COVID panic selling driving the market even further. Uh, so I was actually speaking with uh, someone recently, I see you and he indicated that if there was the possibility for shorting at the time, it could have helped uh, uh, create a better efficiency in the market. In the reality that persons wouldn't have been having to possibly sell in order to avoid a loss, since the only way you can make money is in the direction upwards and not necessarily in both directions. So just uh, just break that down for the viewers and the listeners, David. What does that mean, shorting, short selling? So basic concept is. You borrow stock from your broker, and you would sell it back. Sell it to the mar- You would sell it to the market, and then you would purchase it back at a lower price. Return the stock to the broker, and keep the difference. So instead of you having to absorb a loss of NCB from 198 to 130, you possibly could have just borrowed the stock from your broker, sold it at 198, and possibly bought it back now around 130 while keeping a six dollar spread for yourself. And the JSC indicated in their annual report that they're looking forward to actually pushing for shorting to be introduced this year. Uh, it was a point I made last year's Algerian meetings in the Street Forest who said that they were waiting on the NASDAQ transition before they right. uh, implementing the shorting application on our local markets. Because as it currently stands, only make money in Jamaica the rest of stocks is from capital gains, stock price increasing, and from uh, dividends. In more efficient markets, you can make money from shorting, which is in the case of the downward performance of a stock. You can make money from the call and put options and different uh, market instruments, which create a more efficient market for persons to benefit from uh, the performance of any general market. Auric, tell me, is this, I mean, Stock markets around the world have declined, have been doing poorly over the past few months, as would be expected. But to hear that we're now among the, not the top 10, the bottom 10 in the Mm -hmm. world, is this cause for concern for investors on the Jamaica Stock Exchange? I agree with David. It it doesn't come as a surprise. And and when you compare where we were a couple of years ago versus now, I think it's just strictly numbers when you when you're when you're at the top of something and you and you fell down to the bottom, the magnitude of that loss is far greater than than a, than an exchange that was per se in the middle or so. So um it's not um a surprise that um we are down at the bottom. I think we can use that as a signal to to say, hey, um since we're at the bottom, how, how further can we go? Or is the market fully priced? Um, this is where we start looking for opportunities, um, looking for further buy signals, looking for companies who can adjust and attest to, to, to the change in investment landscape and climate and see how we can benefit from that. Because as it stands now, there's a lack of confidence in the market. Investors are playing a uh, kind of old holding on to their liquidity to see what the earnings numbers look like before they start making the moves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How long before, Stephen, do you think we might be getting back on track? I don't know. That's, that's for the experts. Um, I, think, I think the smart money follows the economy. Uh, I know there was uh, a respected CEO and econ financial analyst, uh, Dennis Trump was saying that um, the economy could dip, dip by 10 to 15 percent. Um, you know, that's that's a, that's more than I guess the standard view that it's it might dip by about five to six percent. Um, 
you know so if if you see the economy taking longer to recover then i guess you you would think that there is also going to be a longer time frame uh, for a recovery in the, in the stock market, um, particularly if there's a rejigging of um, interest rates. Um, you know, that's really going to be a telltale sign. Uh, when you look at the U.S. market, what really helped the U.S. market's recovery is the fact that uh, you had a series of catalysts, and those catalysts were not just uh, catalysts from the companies themselves, but also from the Fed, and the Fed intervened. Um, and as, as a support mechanism, right? Uh, we, we, we're not there yet, but I think we, we need catalysts. Um, investors need catalysts. And the obvious catalyst is, of course, positive earning reports, right? Uh, so that you can reprice uh, the stocks going for, forward based on the actual earnings. But also, you want other forms of catalysts like um, uh, merger and acquisition news. Just deals, just companies putting out information into the market to basically. You know, see. speaking of catalysts, perhaps it is that one of the reasons the Nasdaq is one of those top performing stock exchanges is that in the United States, what the the government has done, what the Fed has done, is they've actually been purchasing securities, helping right. to keep the prices right. up. Absolutely. So, so perhaps the Nasdaq's good performance is artificial. Well, that, that, that's for investors to make um, their own assessment. I mean, certainly, uh, certainly in the U.S., people are more certain about what's going to happen in the next two to three years than they are certain about what's going to happen in the next two to three months. And why that's important is that you can plan. So if you believe that there's going to be a recovery in, in that period of time, then it is it, you are more secure with putting your money with a Tesla, which is fourteen hundred and something dollars per share, even though fundamentally it is a three hundred dollar stock, right? Um, but you can't tell that to people who are buying it at fourteen hundred dollars; they're going to continue to buy it, right? Uh, you don't have that long-term confidence in the local market, nor do you have short-term confidence. So we have neither. And this is why it's important to have some form of catalyst. And, and again, catalysts either from the sectors, as in the actual companies, or a catalyst from, um, from, from the economy, from, from government, um, or from BOJ, something. I, this is for the technical guys to actually um, have a solution, well, but I that's what we need. We need I'd, love to, I'd love to hear David and Oryx's perspective on that. David, what type of catalyst do you think might the market react to? Well, from my, pers from, my, from my simple view in the last couple of weeks, the market has become a lot more sensitive to dividend news. So even though the BOJ gave the financial holding companies and the deposit institutions some leeway in terms of paying up dividends, most persons have, have taken a different direction towards uh, the dividends right now. Everybody's seeking cash. So when Mailpack announced their four cent dividend uh, the prior week, the stock shot up by more than 20% in the same day. Uh, even last week, prior the Indies announced their dividend. Uh, there was some mix up at the beginning. But uh, on the following on Monday, the stock went up by more than 15%, I believe, from around $2.30 to $2.90. Almost, yeah. And that was just based on the news of the dividend. In this dividend, is technically significant since the dividend at the current price at the time was around 4 to 6% in terms of a dividend yield. But the market has become a lot more sensitive towards dividend news from the announcements even to the actual considerations. So oh, oh, right now that's sorry. been the shifting perspective for the market because persons are trying to see where can they get cash right now versus capital gains because even when the JS released their monthly statistics, only a few companies, probably less than 15 at max, are actually up for the year so far. I think people right now are just looking for any positive news, anything yeah. now, <laughs> that is um, hanging on to um, anything. From, from that standpoint, I mean, just to add to what um, Stephen had said, 
um, with the interventions. Most of our economic interventions have been surrounded monetary and fiscal policies. Um, for for from an investment or a stock, stock market standpoint, our our motivation or confidence boosters comes from how are the institutional companies taking positions in in the assets that are list, listed on the stock exchange. So people use those as a benchmark to, to boost their confidence towards investing on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Where are the pension funds investing their money? Where are the, the, the big banks and the large institutional clients are, are looking on the stock exchange for, for long-term investment? So those are the mechanisms that we use to guide our investment decisions. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to, to one of, another big item of news that I don't think it was you that wrote this one, Stephen. I think I saw this one no. in, in Loop News regarding NCB's performance. Uh -huh. NCB now right. at a 52-week low. What do you make of that? Yeah. So, you know, there are only a few people who could have made that trade. What was the trade? Tell, tell What was it? What 10. type of volume? 10.7 billion, billion units. Yeah. Uh, um, which would 10.7 10, 10. 10. million units, which would have been the largest in a year, um, trading in, in, a, in a year, um, you know, within the context where dividends are going to be held off for a year. So, of course, you have a situation of if somebody needs cash, they're going to sell and they're sold. And that's fine. You know, um, it's it's theirs to sell. Um, I, what happened because I'm in mid the middle of June. What happened as as a result of that is that June became the heaviest, had the heaviest volumes in terms of value, uh, in terms of trades for the year, which actually slightly beat uh, the the value of trades in the heavy sell-off in March. So in March, you had about $6 billion worth of um, trades. In June, you had $6.4 So, you know, so we, we, we're getting back to a stage where you're having a lot of trading activity. Hopefully, that will lead to um, positive trading um, to the upside of the market. But um, as it stands, it... it, it it actually, it actually, there was actually some amount of um, resistance where the market did not dip after the heavy sell-off in June. So actually, so the market, the value of the market actually um, went sideways in June. But then, unfortunately, as um, July started, we saw a continuous staircase downward. Um, the current levels so um you know we're not out of the woods yet something needs to happen but in terms of the volumes um you know it seems as if we're having some kind of institutional activity or at least heavy activity going on in the underground which which could you know to people that things are happening because you know you made the point you made the point that yes whoever the shareholder is or shareholders or institution is that made this massive sell in in june they're absolutely entitled to do that but at the same time ncb being the behemoth that it is on the market representing such a large percentage of the entire jamaica stock exchange oops mm -hmm. the way ncb goes it reflects on the entire market. It has an impact on the yeah. value of the entire Absolutely. JSC. It, it does. It does. So. I mean, it's 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 you know Warren Buffett said you know if you if you own a house and you bought it for a million dollars, I'm paraphrasing, and you wake up the next morning and you find that the house is worth one dollar, are you going to sell it? No, you're not going to sell it. Do you own the house? Yes, you own the house, right? Just wait. Wait, and eventually uh, the market will correct itself. David, what do you make of NCB? Because well, they're, that, at, they're at 130 something now, coming down from 133. Two, what was their high? Like 210? It was around 225 around last year. July. That was wow. the all time 249. high. 225. And it started the year at $196. Mm -hmm. 
and now down so, to 130 odd. So what do you make of this dramatic decline, David? Well, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, the new article you're talking about was in relation to the decline in the market capitalization of NCB Financial Group, which is about $8 billion on Monday. And that also accompanied a new low, 52-week low of $130. This doesn't surprise me surrounding the fact that right now NCB has not made a statement like a Sajikor, a JMB, or a Scotia regarding dividends. So persons right now are still expecting that NCB won't pay any dividends. And then you have to consider the reality that persons just right now, as, as Stephen pointed out, possibly, possibly need cash. Because at the end of the day, a stock is still an asset. It has a value. There are buyers and sellers in the market. So there, there will be activity in the, in the market. Uh, in, on the Trinidad Stock Exchange right now, NCB is technically trading at a premium to the Jamaican market. Oh. So in, on the Trinidad market, it closed at $7.88 TTD. But when you convert it to Jamaican dollars, that's around $164 JMD. And in the past, it was always usually the opposite, where the T, where the tier and stock exchange market will be chasing our market in terms of the price. So when it comes down to the whole real story in NCB, you know, the whole party decline, it didn't surprise me. A lot of transactions have been happening from numerous top 10 or significant shareholders in various companies. Even last week, there was a massive sale by someone in Alaska manufacturer that dragged the price down to $3.20. Uh, there were several halt in, in stocks today. And even with regard to check the JST's disclosures for connected parties and directors and insiders, there's been a lot of top 10 transactions. And as Steve pointed out, some persons might be seeing opportunities in deals right now and others might be seeing the time to potentially step back and re-enter later on to capitalize further on potential price declines. So right now, the whole NCB decline, it is expected, considering the context of where we are in the year and the fact that there is a, the market liquidity has been declining. Stephen pointed out that one trade basically significantly drove up the value of the overall transactions for the entire month of June. So right now, as I'm saying, the quote is relatively drying up in the market. By, there are multiple orders going through cleaning up the buy side of the market. So right now, NCB declining doesn't surprise me. But I wouldn't say that we have reached the quote-unquote bottom as yet in terms of the market bottoming out. Because mm. the thing with our market is there are, there are less buyers coming into the market right now. And the reality is persons are still unemployed. A person might need cash. So you don't know what might happen. And NC results are doing two weeks based on their dividend meeting. And we don't know what the true impact we'll see happen, how it happen in Q2. So just have to watch and see. Auric, so, you have anything that you wanted to add on NCB? I mean, yeah, I, I agree. And I can't say directly what um, happened, why the stock has devalued of that, to that magnitude. It would more be a combination of factors. One being investors are in selling mood right now. Um, it's, a, it's a case where people are trying to, to recoup liquidity to seek um, safer assets, maybe bonds or invest in real estate. That might be a major factor. Another factor is that the com companies seem to be revamping their cost structure. Uh, I see that as well. I see uh, they have sent out communication that they'll be, be, be cutting um, staff. And it's a combination of those factors, um, one being liquidity and the other being their internal controls. Mm. Oh, thank you for joining me, guys. Good discussion. All right, thank you. Right. Much appreciated. Now let's take our final break. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, was brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services.
That's almost our show for this week. Thanks for watching. I still have that giveaway, but first make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel and share with a friend. And guys, the newsletter is out, so go to takingstock-ja.com to subscribe. Also turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all my other features. The goal is to get to 50,000 subscribers this year. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. Now this week on Money Mondays JA, an interesting topic, how to understand your light bill. You know, JPS has been in the news a lot lately because of all these high costs and the whole electricity theft issue. Let's actually take a look at your light bill. And then Money Moves JA with Exim Bank, those payment gateways can be a bit pricey. So we're looking at alternative ways of accepting payments for your business electronically. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Now for that giveaway. What was the most traded stock in June? Comment the answer below and I'll announce the winner in next week's episode. You'll be among the first to have our new Let's Get This Money t-shirt. Tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the new sexy, so let's make it cool to talk about money. And don't forget to tag me in your testimonial as well. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Stay safe.